Hi, I'm Ben. I'm Jen. This is uh, Philosophy Friday, um, which uh, with uh, with non uh, non standard backgrounds. Uh, and if you uh, if you hear meowing in the background, it doesn't sound like the typical meows of our cat. Uh, that is uh, my uh, my little brother's cat, uh, Eleanor. Uh, I am this little brother. Yeah. I mean, he's a, he's a grown up, but you know, it's my younger brother. The man's um, in his thirties. <laughs> sure, sure, sure. You should be able to get rid of the little brother at some point. I mean, I guess. I don't know. <laughs> so, uh, so yep, I am visiting him in uh, in Los Angeles. If anyone saw me in the Majority Report earlier today and were wondering about this background, that's why. Um, and, I'm still uh, here in the Michigan backwoods. Yes, but not with the usual background. This is the, but not uh, with my personal background, which is much better, I think. Yours has a stuffed avocado. Uh, my avocado from there. Mexico that Ben brought me from Mexico. Yeah, no, that's mm -hmm. right. Um, so, so yeah, it's uh, it's been uh, it's been a good day. Had uh, had lunch with uh, Nanda Vila earlier. Gonna, uh, gonna, but of course, the highlight of my day. Is uh, is that now I get to talk about aesthetics and David Hume? So let's do that. When you say "be with you," does that mean be with me or be with the the entirety of people who are here? That's not an alien. That's a crab. <laughs> yeah. So crab actually belongs to Ben. <laughs> uh, so I'm informed. So, <laughs> so it Valentine's gift. I had a red theme going for Valentine's Day, so red crab. Fair enough. So, thinking, I guess one way that um, you know to to think about um, this this issue that uh, David Hume is uh, is talking about in this essay, the standard of taste. Uh, it, about aesthetics, which is the branch of philosophy where you're philosophizing about uh, art uh, and related subjects. And one way to think about the issue that he's confronting this essay is that I think a lot of us, a lot of people, when they start to think about it, are very compelled uh, by the intuition that it doesn't really make sense to say that a book or a movie or a painting or anything else is objectively good or bad. They think that uh, beauty is in the eye of the beholder, that it's it's not, um, that it's just a matter of, uh, of personal taste, that what would that even mean that it's objectively good or bad? Is that like, you know, in some weird way, that's like the, the property of the object itself, you know, the, the painting or the movie or whatever? Uh, that's that like would be there if anybody nobody knew that it was there or not. A lot of a lot. I think if you're thinking about it in the abstract, it's it's very easy to uh, to sort of get carried away in that train of thought and say, well, clearly this is it's just all subjective. Uh, but on the other hand, like when you start applying that to particular cases, say, okay, so is um, uh, so does that really mean? that there's no sense in which like i don't know michelangelo is better than bob ross or uh uh that the like no bob ross bashing on this show <laughs> <laughs> the, uh, the happy little trees you know versus the sistine chapel everybody needs happy little trees <laughs> or um or like if if somebody thought that I don't know what's the worst movie I've ever seen. Uh, that movie we were talking about the other day, the the, the Stephen King movie, where you oh, said Green like, Catcher? yes, that is the worst movie I have ever seen. Okay, all right. I don't think it was that bad, but all right. Oh, it was horrific. <laughs> so, um, so if like somebody is looking through the AFI's like top 50 or whatever it is, you know, film list. And they're like, no, no, Dreamcatcher is better than any of these, you know, or uh, I don't know, like they, they talk, uh, think about like, or like the second Transformers movie you know, is way better than, you know, the Godfather. Uh, like oftentimes when you're thinking about judgments like those, right. Is there like 
So is that just purely subjective? That like there's no sense in which like in which the Godfather is actually better than Dreamcatcher or the second Transformers movie. Um, I think when you start thinking about those concrete cases, a lot of people are pulled in the other direction again. They're like, no, wait, that doesn't seem right. Like it, it seems like somebody could very well have that opinion, but that they would be wrong. Right? You know, like the, people get confused about the idea of this is better and I enjoy this more. Right. Even though, like lots of people, pre-philosophical, just normal conversation, do make a distinction between those two things, right? They, they'll say things like, oh, it's a really bad movie, but I love it. Like, Yeah, but some people also say things uh, that, that, you know, I like this better than this, therefore, this is better than this. Right. Yeah, no, that's true, right? So so sometimes people don't make a distinction at all. They just use them interchangeably. But then, like, sometimes I, I think a lot of people do do make a distinction, right? They, they'll say, like, oh, this is a, you know, this is a guilty pleasure, maybe. This is, like, a, uh, this is something. Sure, sure. I, I didn't say, you know, just some people think. And, and, you know, Hume does say this, that we all have our own beliefs and we all know that we are right. You know, and, and we're offended when people think that we aren't right. And when someone else thinks differently, well, that person is obviously wrong. Right, and, right. Uh, yeah, like like we were just arguing about Dreamcatcher. Right. There you go. Uh, although my, my strident defense of it, was, it wasn't that bad. Uh, <laughs> oh, that probably tells you something. Yeah. They're great, by the way. Grits are great if you fix them the right way. Yeah, I, I actually agree. I never, I never used to think so, but uh, I, I actually moving to Atlanta actually did change my mind about that because I started having them a lot more, and uh, and I, I warmed up to them. Um, I, I think that it, our marriage. <laughs> yeah, I think it used to be just be like the fact that kind of looked like mashed potatoes, and so it was always like sort of like mashed potatoes. Though, if they look like something good, then you should think that that they'll also be good. Not, oh, yeah, this looks very, like something I love. I will hate this. This is very different, right? You know, so like the fact that it looked like something I really like and then tasted really different was always a little disappointing. Uh, but then, you know, I, I think since moving to Atlanta, I started to uh, appreciate them uh, in their own right. Uh, and and as, as you said, I think a lot does depend on, on how, you, how you prepare them or even just like what you put on them. So fair enough. Uh, so, uh, so yeah, it, it does, um, and especially I think if you separate the question of what's actually good or bad from like, do you think that the person who doesn't, who like thinks that the bad thing is good or whatever, is like a you know slob or a rube or something you know like that like you just say like uh, you might but like if you think like even if you think the more charitable thing you think uh, has a lot of whiskey uh, so uh, oh, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Uh, so right, I'll try and hit the bottom of it before we're done here. Be an entertaining, <laughs> uh, entertaining friend. Uh, so, uh, I was pouring it from above. Yeah, I had it on this low table, and I was pouring it from above, and got a little carried away, I guess. <laughs> fair enough. So, uh, so yeah, I think because, um, like, if you think about somebody, you know, like, even if you have the like nice charitable interpretation, like, well, look, maybe they just haven't seen very many movies. Or you know they they, they don't uh, you know they, they don't know all of that still assumes that there is a there is a thing for them to know. Right? They're, they're competently acquainted, as Mill would say. They're not competently acquainted with uh, enough movies. Yeah, which is a little kind of a little preview of, of where Hume uh, ultimately goes uh, in, uh, in in this essay, uh, but. Yeah, I mean, I think it is often, like, I think if nothing else, like, there's a book, there's a, uh, let's see, uh, there's a British rock critic named Simon Frith, who has a uh, book called Performing Rights, R-I-T-E-S, 
uh, which uh, which I really like. Like I think it's like the opening chapter of it is like really good on this this issue about like arguing about the quality of the music in his case. Uh, and and he points out like the way that we do that really doesn't track this sort of super subjectivist view that a lot of people have when they first start to think about the abstract issue. Like they first start to think about the abstract issue, like, okay, can art be objectively good or bad? Those think, well, no, of course it can't, right? That that's silly, right? You know, like like you're just like all you're doing is you're just reporting what you like or you don't like. But then Frith points out there that uh, that's really not the way we typically talk about it. Like it's it's not like like our conversations about music or movies or anything else would be way, way less interesting if we were just sort of reporting to each other. I liked it. I did it. Right? You know, it's like that's that's a very uh, that's a very boring conversation. You know, it's like uh, this like if it's just like oh I like Rocky Road ice cream and I don't right. You know, like that's 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 not that interesting and it certainly doesn't fulfill any of the normal social functions of the way that we talk about um that we talk about music or anything else you know that we uh that we do it like as you know like the way he's got some like great like paragraph about this i wish i remember all of you know says we use it to flirt and fight and this and that and he's got like seven other things like that uh but the way we talk I just throw in here uh, i don't know if y'all have seen paddington too but it is fantastic it is objectively fantastic. Even my my father-in-law, who does not tend to enjoy movies like that, he liked it. Everyone I've ever talked to about it has has liked it. Is this the, is this great, the is yes, this the it's a great, off? great movie, and you should should definitely watch it. Also, the first Paddington. Yeah. Uh, so I think the way that that happened, Paddington 2, uh, was in uh, Rotten Tomatoes. Uh, it's uh, it's got a better score than Citizen Kane now, because there was some like ancient review of Citizen Kane that was negative, that was like unearthed and added uh, to Rotten Tomatoes, and so it threw the score off a little bit. So now I down- actually posted this on my on my Facebook a few weeks ago, pointing this out, and I was like, "Well, it's well deserved." What can I say? So. Um, so yeah, it's like Paddington 100, Citizen K99 or something like that. Uh, but, uh, but yeah, so so the way that we talk about art is as if there was something to argue about, that it wasn't just reporting our likes and dislikes to each other, that say like, are you crazy? That was great. And then you, you know, what about this and that and the other thing? You can sort of make a, a case. Um, but then that only seems to make sense uh, if there's like a fact about it that we can argue about, that, that, that if there's, a, that there's like a, a fact that somebody could be wrong about or, you know, make a good case on. And, um, and then that gets confusing again, because like what kind of fact are we talking about, right? Like there's, there's, there's not uh, that, like that's like what, what is the, uh, does the painting have an aura of objective like, goodness? Like that, it seems sort of spooky and silly, you know, when you, when you start like really digging into it. Uh, and I think that that's what like Hume is doing in a lot of those, that, the essays, he's setting it up. He's sort of trying to do both the, it seems ridiculous to say that there's an objective fact here, but like, come on. Some things are clearly better than other things. And it's not just a matter of reporting your likes and dislikes. All right. Well, I mean, that, that as, as usual, I just, you know, pop in to respond to somebody in the, in the chat when you start pontificating, but. Well, I'm, I'm done pontificating. No, that was all my pontificating. That was, I thought I would actually set you up to talk about the humans. I, all right. Well, you know, he gives uh, he gives us two possibilities, which were correct, the, by the way. very correct. But yes, go the on. two possibilities that Ben is talking about. He says there are two ways to look at this, and uh, the one is that there is no objective standard because we're we're dividing here between sentiment and judgment, and judgment is something that refers 
to something outside itself. You know, I'm, I'm, if I'm making a judgment, I'm judging something else. But if I have a sentiment, the sentiment just, it is itself. And, and so there's no way that it can be wrong. It doesn't represent anything about the object. It represents, <laughs> oh, yeah, I have no idea. Um, it doesn't represent anything in the object. It just represents my feelings and my feelings cannot be right or wrong. You know, this is the, the beauty exists in the mind. Beauty is in the eye of the beholder type business. And, um, and then he goes on to say, basically, well, some statements are just ridiculous. And, and this is one of my stock examples that I use for things is when, you know, I ask a, a straight man something that has to do with the appearance of another man. Oh, me man, me straight, me don't know, me not judge other men's attractive. And I, then feel like I, feel, I feel like I've been not. <laughs> you and a whole bunch of other people. <laughs> so, um, but then if you if you put Steve Buscemi over here and Brad Pitt over here, you, can you not tell me as a straight man who's better looking, or is it just I, I don't, they look different? But who can say I don't know who looks better? Yes, you do. Yes, you do. And and this is kind of what Hume is, is referring to here, that some statements are ridiculous. If you told me that Steve Buscemi was more handsome than Brad Pitt, um, that, that would just be a ridiculous statement. And I was having this conversation with my friend Aiden, and he was like, well, what about his wife? Well, that's irrelevant. His wife is biased. Yeah, I think we were using Danny DeVito, actually, instead of Steve Buscemi, but the same thing applies. It's like, what, what about his wife? Well, first of all, his wife is a biased observer. And second of all, she probably can still use her eyeballs and, you know, I'll just leave it at that. You, just, it, you can be biased towards something, <laughs> and but still realize that that something else is objectively better. So anyway, he says that we've got these rules, and these rules are based on our experience and what is that, you know, like like general observations of what people are generally pleased by, and people are generally pleased by the uh, seeing Brad Pitt. It, just as far as handsomeness goes, people are generally not as pleased by seeing Steve Buscemi or Danny DeVito. And and this is where these rules come from, is from, from this experience um, that we have. Yeah. So I guess one way of thinking about this is that if the problem from Hume's perspective comes from the fact that we like clearly when we talk about the, the merit of different artworks, uh, we are talking about it as if there were a matter of judgment, but then you think, well, wait a second, I thought we were just doing sentiment, right? You know, like, and how, and uh, it seems like we can even separate out the two, like, um, you know, if, if somebody says, uh, you know, I, I, I really, you know, it's a it's a terrible movie, but I like it. You know, like they, they they're they're, se they're separating judgment from sentiment. But where does the judgment come in, in the first place? How do you get from sentiment to judgment? And I think uh, so that what you were kind of saying in the last part it seems like you're saying that uh, that you sort of make a judgment that's ultimately rooted in sentiment, maybe. But it's like uh, what sentiment. Uh, like the sort of general features of things that uh, that have that tend to produce like positive sentiments, uh, or or maybe especially like there are parts. I mean, as I remember the essay, there are parts of it where he does sound almost like John Stuart Mill, and you know thinks that like it, it's really it's also um, like what we're really interested in is like what the sentiments would be of people who like really, really knew what they were talking about. Yeah. He talks about how we have to be in a sound state in order to, to really apply these rules. 
uh, correctly. And he talks about uh, delicacy of the imagination, um, delicacy of taste. He says, I, I wrote this quote down, actually, the perfection of the sense or feeling is found united with the perfection of the man. So the more sensitive you are, it's, it's like food. If you, if you are only sensitive to the most smack you in the face tastes, you don't have a good palate. Whereas if you can discern the, um, like me, ben, Ben's over there laughing because he thinks the food that I like is bland. And I tell him it has, you know, delicate flavors or, or whatever, subtle flavors, um, that you have a better palate. And, and he tells a story from, um, what is it? The tilting at windmills? Uh, Don Quixote. Yeah, yeah. With, um, you know, the, the two peasants who were drinking uh, wine and the people are laughing at them because one of them says it tastes like iron and the other one says it tastes like leather. And the, um, you know, the, the people are laughing at them. They think, how ridiculous is this? But then they get to the bottom and there's an iron, iron key that's tied to a leather strap. So the other people were laughing at them, but they actually had the better palate because they could taste the, the nuances. Right. And, and that's what Mill says, you know, we need, to, um, we need to be able, whoever can see the nuances better has better um, aesthetic judgment. Yeah. And somebody asked in the chat uh, how much of that is culturally or whatever learned. Well, uh, part of Hume's essay does directly touch on that point because he, he says that one way that you can tell that something is really good is that it passes the test of time, that you can have something that like basically, uh, I, don't, I think that's pretty much what he says. I don't think I'm simplifying here. It says like, something that's not actually objectively that great can be really popular in like mm -hmm. one society at one time, but it's not going to be appreciated in other societies or at other times. Yeah. He talks about Homer, Homer. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Homer, um, you know, he was popular at the time. He was popular later. He's popular still later. He's popular now. And that's, that's one of the tests, you know, is something going to still be appreciated in different times, different cultures. And um, Homer, yes, you know, Michelangelo, yes, is is pink going to be appreciated uh, a thousand years from now? Really, hopefully not, but I, I doubt it. Yeah, I mean, like, I think one way to, like, certainly something I think about, you know, reading that is like, uh, Sometimes if you're at used bookstores or like garage sales uh, where, where people are selling books, you'll see these things that's like from 1986 or whatever. That's like, you know, New York Times, number one bestseller on the planet. And you're like, what the hell is this? I've never heard of this person uh, since like oftentimes these things are like crazy bestsellers, but then like, you know, whatever. I mean, it doesn't even have to be 1996, 1986. Like, 10 years later, you know, like those people be like, who? What's that? Mm -hmm. um, and, and so that's kind of Hume's point that like things that, um, that there's, there's a reason why I don't even, you know, like that there's some like pick some like class, bit of classical literature. There we'll are, be you know, thinking to kill a mockingbird forever. I was literally just thinking about to kill a mockingbird. And the Da Vinci code, we will not. Right. Yeah, exactly. Like people, they, in fact, probably right now, uh, I don't know how many people read the Da Vinci Code like last year. And that wasn't even that many years ago that that was a, uh, a giant phenomenon. Whereas I think, you know, to, uh, I, I'm a hundred percent certain that in 20 years, you know, that, uh, that, uh, To Kill a Mockingbird, you know, will, will still be popular. And Hume would say that this is a sign, maybe not an infallible sign, but like evidence that something has, uh, like as a work of art, has managed to like have the general features that are tend to be appreciated uh, by by people that you know like for uh, for reasons that aren't just sort of like transiently having to do with like what's going on in that culture at that particular moment in time, uh, and and he says that what we're doing when we're sort of like 
finding like the the good like the determining whether something's actually good you know is is we're being like those peasants you know who can like taste the iron you know the iron key um and of course not everybody's equally able to do that uh and this is the this is the stuff you know we've referred to a couple times it's a little bit like you know what john stuart bill says when he's talking about higher and lower pleasures that uh that you are more able to do that if you've exposed yourself to lots of different you know like if, if it's the uh if the Da Vinci Code uh, was the first thing that you'd ever read that wasn't a picture book or something, you know, then like you'd probably be a lot more impressed with it than you know than if uh, than if you're reading novels all the time, you know, if if uh, if if you hadn't uh, uh, you know if you hadn't seen you know uh, the Godfather, then you know Dreamcatcher, you know, would might be you know might be more you know more impressive to you. Again, I, can't, I, I can't imagine that. <laughs> I can't imagine if that was the first movie somebody ever saw, they would just be like, I have never watched watch a movie movies. ever again. <laughs> Why would anybody ever watch a movie? Movies are terrible. <laughs> but, you know, Hume thinks that, that this is how it's supposed to be. He says that, that the people that have good taste, those people have high status. And, and we listen to those people. Right. And I, and I think that's, that's true. You know, we we pay attention. Not that we always agree, but we pay attention to to things like top lists, top movie lists that are made by movie critics. You know, I would rather if I was looking for a list of the ten best movies, I'm I'm gonna go online and look for movie critics, people who are respected. I'm not gonna just just go next door and and knock on the door and be like, hey, yo, what are your ten favorite movies? I don't care. Right. Yeah. Right. Like, and even if. Uh, and that's certainly like if I want to, even if there's like some very specific movie, kind of movie that I know that I'm in the mood to watch, but let's say I haven't seen very many of those movies, I might still do what you're talking about. I might like Google, you know, like what's the uh, what are the lists that are out there of the you know top 10 movies of, of this kind, or whatever. Uh, and uh, and if I think that it's from a you know a film critic who has seen many, many movies and it's not just some random person, you know, posting the exactly you know, the ten movies that they happen to have seen and they likes. <laughs> uh, then uh, then then I'd i probably um, I'd probably take it more seriously. I think uh, so I guess one one place to go from here would be to ask uh, has Hume totally solved the problem, right? So he has so the, the original problem was on the one hand, there's this kind of subjectivism about uh, artistic quality that seems very compelling, like in the abstract. That, like, uh, that sure, some people, different people, like different things, and there's no fact about it, right? It's just, it's just sentiment. Uh, that sounds to a lot of, maybe not to everybody, but to a lot of people, when they first start to think about it, that sounds right. Uh, on the other hand, it sure seems like some people know what they're talking about in ways that other people don't and that they're like that uh like it, it does seem like uh it does seem it really seems when you start to think about specific cases like some music some movies some you know some books are actually better than others uh and that we can we can make sense of that it's not purely just uh a matter of, of you know and that there's something to argue about there it's not just a matter of of reporting uh, likes and dislikes. Uh, so, so Hume's solution is to say that there are certain like general features of a work of art that uh, that people. So it's like a psychological fact, maybe you know that people are gonna are gonna generally uh, respond uh, to those features. You know that they'll have the sentiments. You know about about those. Well, Hume Hume mentioned something similar to that when he says that that the the things that are good, they they're good means to the ends that they're after. You know, like um, poetry appeals to the emotion. So so whatever pleases us the most by appealing to our emotion, this is this is the best of it. You know, eloquence. What is the goal of eloquence? It's to persuade. So whatever persuades better is better yeah right so so there is so that's so that's like one way that you can 
you can get uh, you can get like a objective determinations of quality sort of on the like very cheaply and conceptually, right? Like that you sort of you get them almost for free because you say, well, uh, sometimes like yeah, if you have specific goals, I mean that's then like some things are better at achieving those goals than others, and and that's and that's not. Uh, and it look, at least it's, it looks like that's not going to be subjective, although we can maybe push on that. Like, so if you are writing a tragedy and uh, it doesn't make people sad, right? Then uh, then you haven't achieved your your goal. If you if and the, that's not going to, it's not very good. Right. If tragedy doesn't make people sad, then you failed. Right. And if. Um, uh, right, or you know, whatever the schmancy thing you'd say that Aristotle think about tragedy inspires uh, it's a catharsis of pity and fear, or whatever it makes people sad. So, uh, and then, uh, and if and if a co and you know, a horror movies are supposed to be scary, and uh, and and comedy is supposed to make you laugh, um, uh, like, and so think, well, if you write a comedy and uh, and, and it doesn't make people laugh that it's not a good comedy because it hasn't achieved the goal of, of comedy. So that makes sense. Uh, and then that's one way that you can start to think about the idea of like general features of some work of art that you know pe that people are going to respond to. But then, uh, but then if you were to say, all right, I think in a lot of ways this is like a pretty good solution to that problem that we started with. But you might still, you know push on it a little bit, you know, be like some jerk philosopher who's never satisfied with anything. And, uh, I know and, you're talking about me. <laughs> and you could, uh, and you could say, well, hold on now. Um, is it really going to be the case that we're all going to respond in the same way? to things, right? I mean, like I saw somebody in the chat saying something like, okay, so is this just like a statistical thing? Uh, that, like if, if uh... Partly. I mean, I, I think partly, yes. No, because the, the things that, that live on, why do they live on? Because more people like them than other things. Yeah, so like one because like they, I think there are a couple different ways that you might think, well, you know, for Hume's view to work, we all, or at least most of us maybe, if it is partly a statistical thing, uh, have to respond in the same way uh, to these, these general features. And you could ask whether that's really true. So one way that you could ask whether it's really true is that you could say, well, maybe some of it, you know, we, we already talked about this a little bit, but you know, maybe some of it varies based on culture. Uh, and Hume's got his answer to that, right? You know, that, uh, well, what's going to pass the test of time and be appreciated in different cultures at different times. Uh, or maybe, like, some of it could just be innate even, like, maybe, like, just different, uh, like, different people are just going to be psycho psychologically a little bit different or, you know, different personality types maybe. Uh, and they're going to uh, and they're going to respond uh, and they're going to respond to things uh, things differently. Um, yeah, what do you mean differently? Like like people who who like things certain things better than other things, or people who remember your dad was saying the other night, and I don't remember what movie he was talking about, but they uh, in the theater and he laughed, and nobody else was. I think that might have been Mama Mia too. <laughs> Am I right about that? That would go to him that he would see Mom Mia too. Uh, um, yeah. yeah. So is that what you mean? Like people who react, some people think it's funny and some people think it's sad. And yeah. Uh, yeah, I, mean, I guess that would be an extreme example. Um, I think, um, yeah, we're just the other day, we were listening to that Patton Oswald thing about uh, Jerry Maguire said uh, people, you know, he was telling this story about uh, drinking with his brother in L.A. on Christmas Eve and Jerry Maguire had just come out. And uh, it's, 
they go to the theater and there's this whole riff about how dingy the theater is. Now everybody else there is seeing the movie by themselves on Christmas Eve and how empty it is. And they're watching Jerry Maguire and Pat Oswalt says, you know what, I kind of liked it. My brother, unbeknownst to me, hated it. And there's this moment just before that you had me at hello uh, where Tom Cruise says, we live in a cynical world. And his brother shouts out, fuck you. And he just start, he just loses it laughing. And, uh, and he, he says, people ask him uh, what his favorite comedy is. And he says, Jerry Maguire with his brother yelling, fuck you, you know, two hours in. So it's a two hour setup, you know, for, for one punchline. Uh, but, uh, but yeah. I, I must have missed that. I must have been reading. Okay, I think I, I think Aiden and I were listening to yeah. it. Uh, I was but, with my Kindle in the back seat. <laughs> Uh, but yeah, so that'd be an extreme. That'd be an extreme example, maybe. But like, then you ask, okay, with like, you know, maybe these things just are like objectively bad, and like, you know, some people feel forgiving of them because of other things in the movies they like, you know. But like, nobody actually has like a good response to it. But maybe there are like say people are forgiving of them because then right there, you're not that ideal, impassive, completely objective observer anymore. Right. Because you're bringing other things into it and you're not just considering that one thing in and of itself. Right. Yeah, right, okay, that's true. Um, it's like when you get to know somebody, uh, whether it's it's a romantic interest or just a friend or, or whatever, the more you get to know somebody, the more your initial um, evaluation of their appearance, it changes. You know, if you really like somebody in whatever way, they look better to you than they did uh, when you when you first met them. Right. So that's that's not going to like like the thing about Danny DeVito's wife. You know, that's not an object. You you can't ask someone who's in love with somebody. I actually think they've divorced now, so never mind. Um, but you can you can't ask somebody um, who's who's in love with somebody to objectively evaluate them. You just can't. Right. Yeah. I mean, when you first met me, you thought I was like circus ugly, but you know, there you are. <laughs> Since then. <laughs> wow. <laughs> no. Um. And when you when you met me, you thought I was super hot, and that just went downhill. Um, yeah, yeah. The more better, I, better, I, better I knew you. Woof, that would have went. Yeah, no, fair enough. So, uh, so yeah, these are always like 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 all of this stuff is stuff that Hume can handle, you know, because this all works on his view. Because you you don't these are cases where people aren't uh, properly dispassionate observers. That they're they're being influenced in some way or another. Like I think what you'd really need to create a difficulty for his view would be like um, different critics who are equally knowledgeable and equally dispassionate, uh, and somehow just just come to um, to completely different conclusions. Uh, and and but how many times has this happened? Uh, you know, sometimes you you do see like the um, what that that Paddington Two is better than that, or that has the what what movie was that again? Citizen Kane. Yeah, you've got that one guy who uh, who says no, but then you've got everybody else who says yes, and um, you know you you might have the occasional disagreement but on the things that do stand the test of time how much disagreement is there really going to be right right uh and so i so I, I guess some of the question here is just empirically like is there going to be enough variation in human psychology that uh that some people that like you you're going to have the critics who are equally knowledgeable and equally dispassionate and you know check all the all the same boxes to exactly the same degree uh who are going to have uh completely different judgments uh about things that have existed for a long time and you know etc 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 
and maybe that, right? I mean, maybe maybe just as a matter of human psychology, um, you know, there isn't enough variation that, for that. You know, that like, I mean, obviously you do have, like, you do have critics who strongly disagree with each other, but uh, that by sure. itself, yeah. Yeah, but but I think you know, like like that guy disagrees about Citizen Kane, but how many are on one side and how many are on the other side? So you're you're going to have some outliers, uh, regardless. But and and another thing I think where you get disagreement is you have people judging. People have their and and this just goes along with being a human. You know what what do you like best in a movie? What do you like best? What are you looking for? What are you looking for? And a movie might succeed more in some ways than in the others. And then depending if you're looking at this way or this way, you know I really like cinematography or I really like a good direction. I really like this, that, the other thing that, you know, are the, the elements of the movie are unequally weighted. Right. Yeah. Right. So, uh, and that maybe, yeah. So I guess that's, although that maybe does suggest another way that differences of opinion could, could arise even among extremely knowledgeable and dispassionate uh, critics because it's one thing to say when we're talking about questions like does you know comedy make people laugh does the tragedy you know inspire catharsis of fear and pity uh whatever uh that you might say okay like these are like maybe relatively straightforward goals and we can see like does that achieve that goal or not but uh maybe uh with other kinds of ways of evaluating art uh, there are a bunch of different standards that you can apply to the same thing and different critics are going to weigh those differently. And uh, yes, that's why the, the awards, you have so many different kinds of awards, you know, you have the award for the, the cinematography and the writing and the acting and the music and the costumes because, because there's so many different elements and we're all going to have different weights that we put on those elements, you know, like, like, you know, what my biggest yeah. thing about a movie is the, the, the biggest factor in whether I'm going to like a movie most of the time, unless it just blows me away with everything else. Are there hot people in it? That's what I want to know. You know, I enjoyed the last Charlie's angels. Why? Because oh God, that, was awesome. was in it. that was the only thing that mattered to me. I got to look at Kristen Stewart for two hours. How could that possibly be bad? Way worse movie than Dreamcatcher. <laughs> well, I disagree about that. Um, so yeah, you know, I I want to see hot people. Other people are interested in other things, and um, you know, those are are going to influence our judgments. Yeah, uh, I don't think that's even a criteria that Hugh mentions in the in the essay. It's not. I don't understand. <laughs> yeah, weird, weird oversight. Uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. So not everybody is as willing to be blunt as I am, and that's that the very, that's very the issue. True. That's very true. Uh, so, <laughs> so yeah, you could. Um, so I, I guess. Like on Hume's view, I wonder if there is a problem about criteria, like not in the sense of, well, maybe in the sense of like the, those like categories, the different awards are for, but like that there are, but that there are lots of criteria that you could use to evaluate like a, a work of art because maybe it's like doing a lot of different things and, you know, and, and some of them, you know, it's, it's doing better than others. And so, um, one, like, like an obvious problem for Hume's view would be if like some of the general features just don't work the same way for different people that like, that they, there's some things that, uh, that have, that inspire, you know, totally different sentiments that you're, uh, you know, one, you know, person's like, just, you know, one person who's not biased in any of the ways that he wants to rule out is uh, is carried away by the beauty of it, and one person thinks it's hysterically funny. Uh, that's uh, so that would be one problem. But then, like an even different problem, maybe for for Hume's view, would be if um, you have 
like what a, like if you have a bunch of different criteria to to apply within the same whatever to the same movie say uh because the movie's doing a lot of different things and and maybe everybody agrees on how well it's doing those things but if what we're interested in is making an overall evaluation of the movie uh then you've got a one level up version of the original problem maybe which is like is there an objective right answer to which of these things like matters more like if is it is it more important that i don't know like a novel has like a uh, beautiful writing on a sentence by sentence level and creates atmosphere or is it more important that the characters or yeah the story are compelling or you know whatever right like uh, like, do you have, I would say no to that. I would say that's just a matter of personal preference, but then once you get down to evaluating those pieces, then you can look at that objectively. And, you know, a movie is a very complicated thing. Uh, not all art is as complicated, like a statue. It, it, it doesn't have you know, sound and costuming and cinematography and all this. It just, it is what it is. And there aren't as many different elements that are coming together. Yeah, no, that's true. Although I could still, I don't know, I'm probably going to embarrass myself very quickly because like within about three sentences of talking about this example, it become clear that I know nothing about statues. But, uh, but I think... David, not David, yeah, your yeah. brother. David the statue. Yes, I, I'm aware that David is okay, well, a statue. Think about that. Although, although, although I'm going to be honest here, the main reason that I immediately remember that David is the name of the statue is that there's a Simpsons episode with the statue of David in it. Of course, that's why. Of course, that yes, and most statues are naked, including David or David. I mean, who knows how those people were pronouncing it? But you know, y'all, y'all get the idea. Yeah. Um, so. So yeah, I don't, I don't know. I mean, they. Uh, must have been pretty good, and they wouldn't have done a Simpsons episode about it. <laughs> <laughs> you know the the plots in in Jeeves; those are are pretty. Uh, those are pretty great too. The language is great. The plots are are great. It's it's all great. Fair and then you put it in, into the TV show, and the acting is great. Yeah, TV show is a lot of fun. Uh, but even with statues. I would imagine that there are probably um, ways that, I don't know, something about the statue is designed to provoke some sort of emotional response. I would guess if I wasn't a complete philistine about this, I would, I would be able to say something about that. Well, I would uh, think so because, uh, because everything having to do with art is designed to provoke an emotional response. So. Yeah, sure. I, I just can't talk about it in a kind of detail way because I don't know anything about statues, but uh, like visual art in, in general, I'm, 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 uh, I'm, I'm pretty ignorant about. Um, I, I get like I'll, I'll uh, like I've, I mean, Jed hates this. I'll like go to an art museum and, uh, and I've, got, I've got about 20 minutes of, you know, wandering around looking at stuff before I get bored. And sit down in the cafe and read. Yep, that that is that is how I do. That is that is not one of your sterling qualities, that, of which you have many. But but that isn't that isn't up there on the list. I mm. must say. Fair enough. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, but in any case, I would think that like, if I were in any position to to speak in with any kind of depth about this, that there are various things that's designed to provoke some emotional response and. That's like that it's or that you might care about realism or you might care about the way that it's like something about the way it's done is like an attempt to say something about like tradition. That like there are other statues that were made in a certain way. And you're doing it in a slightly different way to try to say something about that. And that like there's probably uh, I'm I know this is literally and figuratively hand wavy, you know, but, uh, you know, there's a discussion you can have about that. And then, uh, and then the again, it seems like the question that Hume started with could be asked one level up. So, is there like a objectively correct way of of weighing how much all that matters, or if one 
critic who checks all of Hume's boxes um, has comes to a different overall conclusion about the quality of the statue than another critic who checks all of the boxes. Like, is that just like, oh, that really is like, in other words, is it objective? Like, like as one, and I don't think anything Hume says quite settles this, but I mean, we could ask like, maybe forget Hume interpretation, just objective truth. Uh, is there, uh, assuming that something like Hume's view is true or sort of true or close to being true, uh, capture some part of the truth, uh, is uh, like, is it that how much different criteria matter is subjective, but it's objective how well you've met those criteria? I think that sounds right. Uh -huh. All right. Well, we solved aesthetics. Good talk. <laughs> you know how you brought up uh, realism, like like how that's one one thing that that people might like about that, and and the interesting thing is that in studies done in a in a multitude of cultures, that is what people prefer. People prefer uh, art that looks like reality. You know, and and child, even children. You know, we there there's this evolutionary evolution. Uh, you know, this draw towards things for evolutionary reasons. Like like people prefer landscapes with with water and tree. You know, healthy healthy looking landscapes and things that look like the East African savanna. People have preferences for that. And, and that's where much of human evolution is thought to have taken place, is there in, in the East African savanna, and people tend more towards landscapes that look like that. Yeah. Although, you know, the Simpsons, everybody's like yellow, and they have like the, Bart's got the weird hair spikes and everything, and, and that's... Uh, and that's something that I feel like I instinctively recognize as one of the crowning their artistic achievements of mankind. So uh, I, I don't know what to say about that, but uh, for, you just, if you were to just look at that, you know, the painting, if you showed that and then uh, a beautiful landscape, what people would think was better, uh, and, you know, people would, would prefer the landscape. People's favorite colors are people's favorite favorite color the the most popular favorite color is blue and the second most popular is green why is this why isn't it just you know like like some percentage prefers red and some similar percentage prefers you know everything else <clears throat> because this is all this is what we looked for this is what you know brog and our ancestors were out there looking for was the green and the blue so yeah. I, there, there is an element to what we prefer that has has come down to us through through evolution. Yeah, it's kind of funny that you mentioned that example because I was just watching some. I'm writing something about Christopher Hitchens, and I was just watching a video where. Well, I mean, he also talks about this one of his books, uh, where he says that like his his uh, doubts about religion as a child can, you know, be traced back to when he was a, I don't know, British equivalent of whatever they call it, elementary school, I guess, uh, the uh, uh, primary school, uh, whatever that is. Uh, and his, uh, his like English teacher, right, you know, was, uh, was also uh, maybe just slightly older than that, but not that much, I think. Uh, his English teacher was also his uh, scripture teacher and uh, says everything was going along fine until she decided one day to, uh, uh, or no, it was the scripture teacher wasn't, she wasn't an English teacher, she was the scripture teacher and she was also the like nature science teacher. And so she said everything was going along fine until one day when she decided to combine her two roles, they were like on a, like a nature walk. And she was like, isn't it great that God in his beneficence has uh, made all of the plants and everything green, the color most pleasing to his eyes and he says, even as a kid, he sort of instinctively recognized that that was the wrong way around. Uh, that it's it's not that uh, it's it's not that God made all this stuff green because our uh, uh, because that's the color most pleasing to our eyes. It's that it's the color that's most pleasing to our eyes because you know nature is is full of greenery. Yeah, yeah. I mean, um, 
some some people are talking about their fa Ben's favorite color is red. My favorite color is gray, closely followed by pink. So, you know, we're we're outliers, but in general, that is what people like. And another thing that I remember somebody uh, somebody bringing up is the ideal female form has changed, but it's it's fluctuated uh, depending on the scarcity or the plentifulness of food. You know, in, in places where food is scarce, larger women are preferred. And in places where food is, is plentiful, smaller women are preferred. So there's still that, that there's a reason behind it. It's not just, you know, cultural, you know, yeah. toss, toss a coin and, and see how it lands. You know, there are, are reasons behind it. And this, I mean, we all know about, people prefer facial symmetry and, and heterosexual men like, you know, they, right. you know, big boobs and, and, you know, low waist to hip ratio and stuff. And then women like a strong upper body and for, you know, taller men, you know, these aren't just, there, there's a reason for this, you know, those are the people who are going to produce the best offspring. So that that right there seems like an argument for an objective standard of beauty because it's, it's ingrained in us. Yeah, or at least, yeah, right, like objective, uh, you know, the, you know, Martians, you know, might, uh, you know, with a, have a different evolutionary history. And so they'd have, they'd have different, uh, you know, they, they'd have uh, different, uh, different standards of, of, you know, beauty. I mean, what they found attractive in other Martians and also uh, in, uh, and, but also maybe on Hume's view, like it really would be like in that case, right? If there were Martians, if there were Martian art critics, uh, then, uh, then, the, then the difference between them and the earthly ones, right? Really would be like, like he, I think he'd have to accept some relativism there, but like as long as we're talking about humans, he'd say it's objective. Sure. So okay, it's it's not as objective as say math, but you know, I still yeah, but it's, it's, it's but, objective. And no, we are not going to discuss that. <laughs> by the way. Yeah, yeah. So you could say uh, so. It's it might not be objective in the way. Uh, well, no. Math is an interesting question because there's, I think there's some like interesting philosophical debates about whether, like, whether there are exactly facts that we're discovering about okay, math. Okay, okay. Like, but, 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 but maybe like physics, right? It's not as, it's not objective in the sense that physics is maybe, but it's definitely, if something like this human view is right, it's definitely not subjective in the way that other things might be that like uh that if um like maybe there's a sense in which we say good right when we're like we really do just mean like i like it you know right you know oh, good burger uh that uh uh so it's not subjective in that sense that it's it's still there's still a sense there's still like a strong interesting sense in which there's an objective standard that you can use yeah and, and somebody was saying it, the, the borders kind of sound fuzzy. And I think that's exactly how it is. You know, I think there's the, like, like I keep saying, you know, there's the, the Tom Cruise and the Brad Pitt up here and the Steve Buscemi and Danny DeVito down here. Ben Burgess is the, and the Ben Bur I, I can't, the Ben Burgess is way up there. And, um, but then you know you're you're way up there. You got got the set of Chris's way up there. You know Chris Hemsworth, Chris Pine, Chris Evans, um, and people have those in different orders. So mm -hmm. so yeah, you know there there can be some small variations. But I think the big you know yes, Brad Pitt is going to be towards the top. Tom Cruise is going to be towards the top. Certain people are going to be towards the bottom. But but you can have little little micro you know, variations in, in how you order, order people. Yeah. So, okay. So that's interesting. So on your view, it's, um, so maybe there's like a objectively correct. Yes. Language. Son and gender, husband and wife. Yes. I'm sorry. That's a, that's a very important question. <laughs> See, I personally do not put Chris Pine 
uh, up there with Chris Hemsworth, but you know that's a thing. The the Chris the Hollywood Chris is so. You know. So you could so so you might think that there's like a uh, objectively correct um, like range to put them in, but then like yeah. it, it's it's relative to individual preference within the range. Yeah, yeah. There's yeah. Okay. Yeah, like if you're if you're putting Steve Buscemi above Tom Cruise, that's wrong. But you can you can switch around Chris Evans and Chris Hemsworth, and that's fine. All right. Um, this has been good. Uh, yeah, no, that that's fine. Uh, not every just because we have the, the, the same the, last name, you know, we can be brother and sister. We can be completely unrelated. I'm just, you know, usually uh, I guess this is your first time. We usually do the show together, you know, sitting side by side. Today is an anomaly. Um, so, Mr. Buscemi, if you're watching the show, he's not. I, I'm so sorry. Uh, <laughs> Why? Do you think he thinks he's attractive? Man, I hope so. I mean, like, he's not just going through life, you know? <laughs> actually, actually, I read that this is very similar to the Dunning-Kruger effect. The uglier people are, the harder time they have pinpointing the level of their own attractiveness. Ugly people will overvalue themselves. Attractive people will undervalue themselves. And uh, and and the more unattractive you are, the harder time you have hitting the mark. Fair enough. Uh, <laughs> anyway, uh, I'm probably at the top. Yeah. No, I I, I apologize, Steve. Uh, come come on the show. You can come talk to us about the Sopranos. So uh, so um, yeah. If you're watching this, other than Ben. You are the most attractive man I have ever seen, and that is for real. All right. Well, you at least included the correct caveat. So uh, this is good. We solved aesthetics. I uh, <laughs> should uh, should say uh, say before we uh, we wrap up uh, for tonight that on Sunday there is not going to be a Sunday night debate breakdown. Let's do a clip uh, since uh, see above. Um, I am uh, traveling right now. Um, but we're going to be back the Sunday after this one uh, to finish up the uh, Zizek Peterson. If I got um, reference, go right on. Um, and uh, on Monday, even though I will still be in LA and I'm not going to be able to be in front of a computer for like three hours, like usual, we will do something at the uh, at the usual time on uh, on, on Monday. So. Uh, so, uh, so do uh, do tune into uh, to that, and then we'll be back to normal scheduled programming on uh, on Wednesday. Going to talk about uh, Total Recall uh, with uh, with with Forrest and uh, and Ryan and our graphic designer Jay Andrew World, uh, and uh, and then we'll be back uh, for Philosophy Friday next week. So, do we know what we're doing? Not yet, unless not you have yet. a suggestion to make on the fly. <laughs> Jay Andrew, we will let you know before Thursday night what we're going to do. Enough. Fair <laughs> enough. Sounds good. All right. Uh, thank you, everybody, for, uh, for, for watching. These are always really fun. Left is best. Team Snoopy forever. forever.